Vampire Survivors, the unassuming little game that practically spawned an entire genre all on its own. For real, you can't go five feet these days without finding another game that was inspired or directly copied Vampire Survivors. Now, because I'm constantly getting comments that complain that I'm using the word clone in these videos, despite not really taking that word seriously myself, I'm not going to use that word this time, and we're just going to call them what they are. A new genre name has popped up. Or maybe two. Choose your favorite, Survivor-like, which I absolutely hate, or Bullet Heaven, which is still bad, but quite a bit better. About a year ago now, I did a video where I went over a bunch of quote-unquote clones of Vampire Survivors. Talked about what they did good, what they did bad, which ones I liked and which ones I didn't. And despite the whole thing being old hat by now, I still kind of enjoy the gameplay loop that these games offer. They're fun, they're simple, and they're addictive. And on top of all of that, they're pretty cheap. They're often only $5 or even less. So it's easy to make an excuse to, to buy them, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the interesting thing about following a new genre created by one or two games in that style is that you can kind of see how they evolve over time. Last time, I covered a bunch of games that were pretty close to what Vampire Survivors already was. So it, it's hard to kind of justify playing those new games over what Vampire Empire Survivors already is. Why go for the imitation when you can go for the original? They succeeded for a reason. But this time, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different route. Most of the games that I'm gonna be covering in this video are still in that Survivor-like or Bullet Heaven genre, but rather than being extremely close to what Vampire Survivors already is, they're gonna be doing something quite a bit different and quite a bit unique, at least for the most part. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll find something to spend $5 on. So let's stop wasting time and dive into a few games. The first game is called Vampire Hunters. Yeah, I know, not a very big divergence from what Vampire Survivors is as far as the name goes, but as far as gameplay goes, there's quite a bit that's different. First off, and you'll probably notice this right away, you keen-eyed viewers of mine, is that it's a first-person shooter rather than a top-down, one-handed video game. And in a lot of ways, it's a pretty faithful recreation of the Vampire Survivors-like gameplay translated to a first-person shooter. You kill monsters, you collect orbs that fall out of them, and then you level up and then upgrade your abilities, which in this case are guns and artifacts. They like to sell themselves as Vampire Survivors meets Doom, but I don't really see the Doom in this. Sure, you've got demons, you've got some crazy weapons, but you're not moving around like Doom Guy, you're not doing overly gratuitous violent takedowns of things, and in fact, you're not exactly even shooting the gun on your own, or guns in this case, because you can hold up to like 10? Something like that. But what this game lacks in Doom, it makes up for in just pure absurdity. Again, you keen-eyed viewers of mine might notice that I'm not holding just one gun, I'm holding way too many of them. This is kind of cool, you can shoot a lot of guns at the same time, meaning you can have a lot of weapons and bullets and stuff flying at any point in the match. This is very reminiscent of Vampire Survivors, obviously, where you can have a bunch of different abilities and weapons going at the same time. And as visually chaotic as Vampire Survivors could be, Vampire Hunters takes that and laughs in its face, because this game can be very, very overstimulating visually. Once you get a few different guns and there's just swaths of enemies on the screen, it can be very easy to lose track of the things that you're shooting, especially if you're trying to squeeze through a small gap so you're not taking a lot of damage. Overall, I thought that this game was quite a bit of fun for the amount of time that I sunk into it. It at least nails the core loop, but it doesn't really seem to have a lot to keep me around for the long term. It's only got one level, and despite being able to level up a bunch of weapons that you can start with, or level up your stats outside of a match, which doesn't really take very long to max most of them out, there's not a lot of reason to keep coming back. The only reason that I did find is that there's a lot of mutators that you can unlock to spice up gameplay. They're not done updating this game, but so far it's an interesting attempt and something that I don't hate, so good on them. But I think what really makes this one interesting is that it's not just the survivor-like game. But what makes this one interesting is that it's actually two games in one. 
There's a classic mode that they made before this Vampire Survivors-like mode. And in that mode, it's more of a level-based affair where you're going down hallways, attacking enemies, dodging bullets, and leveling up your guns, mostly the same guns that you get in the Survivors style of the game. And you do it in a more Brotato style where you're buying things from a shop and merging them to make them more powerful. That part of the game seemed a little more fleshed out whenever I played, but it's interesting having two completely different games in one package like this. So it's not a bad value for your money if you enjoy the game. Anyway, next game. This one is called Swarm Grinder. And honestly, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this one, but it does do a lot of things uniquely that I thought were pretty interesting. One of the biggest departures is the way that enemies spawn. Normally in Vampire Survivors or games like it, enemies will spawn off screen, sometimes even on screen, and just kind of approach you. Instead, you're the one spawning the enemies by popping all of these bubbles on the map by approaching them, or shooting them, or doing something else. There's multiple ways to pop them, but the point is, you're in control of the waves of enemies for the most part. It adds an interesting layer of decision making that isn't really present in a lot of these games, which is really fun to interact with. Sometimes the bubbles even have environmental hazards, and the fact that you're going to be fighting these enemies and you don't want to be touched by them means you're going to be running yourself into spawning more enemies as you're trying to run away from the enemies that you already can't kill. It can make things pretty tense and pretty exciting. There's also a unique battery mechanic, which means you have to be active at all times, otherwise you're going to be underpowered as the match goes on, and the game forces you to be proactive, searching the map for uh, drill things, and that's how you get your upgrades. And once you get enough of those, the end boss spawns, and then you can get out of there. Unfortunately, there's a very small selection of upgrades, and a small selection of characters, and a small selection of levels. And after about an hour and a half to two hours, I felt like I had already seen everything. There's a big chance that this game's gonna be updated more and more over time, and it's going to be expanded even more. So maybe they'll take all of these fun, unique ideas and turn it into a bigger game with more replay value. But as it is now, there's not really a whole lot for me to engage with. It was a cool hour or two, and I had fun with what I did play. So hopefully they improve it. Definitely keep an eye on this one. Next, we have Halls of Torment, a game that I can only describe as Diablo 2 and Vampire Survivors having a baby in the best way. You've got multiple different characters and classes with different kinds of auto attacks and slightly different upgrade paths and stats and different skill focuses for what you want to upgrade. The game plays a lot like Vampire Survivors, but it looks a lot like Diablo 2 and has some enemies and items and graphics and characters that make you think that it could be Diablo. My nostalgia riddled brain could not get enough of this game, and it turns out that this happens to be my favorite game out of all the games that I'm going to be covering in this video. There's just something about it that feels better than the other ones, and they're updating it at a pretty quick pace, which is always nice to see. The visuals aren't the only thing that are inspired by Diablo 2. There's also a simple inventory system. Your character has a bunch of inventory slots and you can fill them with the type of items that fit the character the best. You go down into the depths and then you fight a bunch of dudes, you open up a treasure chest and ooh, there's an item you don't have. And it actually works really well for the character that you're running right now in the build that you have going. But do you want to send it back up to the surface so you can use it in future runs? Or do you want to keep it and let it help you get to the end of this match? Bit of a risk and reward there, although I always like to send my favorite items up as quickly as possible. You can only choose one, which you know gives you a nice little decision-making mini-task, if you will. There's also multiple different levels, almost like different acts in Diablo 2, and they've got increasing difficulty and varying complexity, and all of that adds to the replay value and the feeling that you're progressing through the game. And speaking of progress, there's a bunch of different achievement trees with tasks tied to just about everything in the game, and it gives you an active goal that you can push for to unlock more things. It's always good to see systems like this. Also, one of my favorite things I think about Vampire Survivors are the subtle little secret objectives that exist in a lot of the levels. This game also does that. Did they steal it? Maybe. Do I care? No. Neither should you. 
This game rocks. You should probably go play it if you haven't already. Next up, we have Death Must Die, which I can only describe as like Hades and vampire survivors had a baby, but then had an affair with Diablo 2, but now the kid has the DNA of all three of those games, in the best way possible. As far as the basics of the gameplay go, it's the closest to vampire survivors that just about any game in this video is going to get. Halls of Torment might be closer, but this one feels more Vampire Survivors-esque. And of course, that's where that comparison comes in. The Diablo 2 comparison comes in because there's a complex inventory system that is more like Diablo than Halls of Torment was. Halls of Torment had relatively simple items with simple stats. Death Must Die, on the other hand, it has the same kind of inventory system and stat bloat that your favorite action RPG is going to have. Whether it's Grim Dawn or Path of Exile or Diablo 2, 3, 4, whatever. There's going to be a lot of items, a lot of rarities, and a lot of stats to dig through and equip all of your characters with. It's kind of intense. I don't really like that so much, but it is fun to find a lot of the unique weapons that have unique effects. If the developers of Death Must Die ever watch this video, my advice to you is to make items drop less, but make items more interesting. Give them more powers and, and more synergies and more fun things. Minor stat upgrades, those are never like super fun for me. But I'm just one man, other people probably really dig this, so I don't know. Anyway, also like Diablo 2, as you're roaming the map, there's a lot of shrines and treasure chests and things to interact with that give you either temporary buffs or buffs that last throughout the entirety of the run, or they give you items or gold or something to take back with you. But like Hades, when you level up, a bunch of different gods come down from on high, they talk smack at you, and then they offer you some of their power. Greetings to you, champion. I am the Arbiter of Justice. It is a pleasure to finally meet. Death has wronged both your kind and mine, and for this he must face the law. Will you help me carry- There's different rarities of the power, and you can level up the powers, and those are what define your build during a run. It does the same annoying thing that Hades does and kind of decides which subset of the gods that it's going to give you as you go in. And I don't think the game or the gods are very balanced well against each other. I often found myself winning a run if I got a certain selection of gods, but if I didn't get those one or two gods in a run, I felt like I couldn't get anything accomplished just because I didn't have enough survivability or I didn't have enough damage or I didn't have enough cooldown reduction or, or whatever it is. I don't remember what the meta that I figured out was, but I do remember it being kind of annoying when I didn't find the power-ups that I wanted once I understood what I needed. Hades, on the other hand, kind of had that, but every god felt a lot more viable than they do here. So there's definitely some work to be done there. And, you know, it's early access, so, you know, give them time. It's, it's a cool game. There's no synergies between the gods yet, but that is on the roadmap from what I've seen. And even though the build that I played only had one map, again, there's going to be more acts on the roadmap. So I can see this game getting pretty big, not just in like virality, but in like content. So this one's definitely worth playing and worth following. So the balance feels off not just for the gods and the powers that they offer, but also for the enemies. It often felt like some of the enemies and some of the bosses, which have a set pattern like in Vampire Survivors, it felt very difficult to dodge some attacks and overly punishing to get hit by one or two fireballs, for example, from the Necromancer in the middle of the run. Some of the bosses felt like they hit way too hard. So maybe some numbers need to be tweaked there, maybe some projectile patterns need to be tweaked here and there. But overall, this game has a really good base. And one cute little thing that doesn't really affect the gameplay, but I thought was a lot of fun, was the characterization for each of the characters. Not just like the character that they are, but how they are written in the text. Like we all have a friend who types like this rogue, right? We all have a friend that types like this mage. You can kind of understand the personality of the characters through the way that they type, even though they're not typing, it's just a way to characterize and like give a voice to the character without actually giving them voice acting. And I think that's a really creative way to portray a character in a game like this. Really cool idea. 
So before I move on to the final game, I want to give a special shout out and honorable mention to Risk of Rain, specifically Risk of Rain Returns. In my eyes, this is not a survivor like or a bullet heaven, but it really scratches a very similar itch. You pick a character, you spawn into a world, you explore to collect loot and level up, and you attack hordes upon hordes upon hordes of enemies and try your best to not die. Look, I don't think Risk of Rain needs to be introduced, but Risk of Rain Returns is a remake of the original Risk of Rain, which just recently came out and I've been relatively addicted to it recently, so I thought I'd mention it, but not just because I was addicted to it, but because the next game is more of a Risk of Rain-like than a Survivor-like. And I think if I didn't mention it in this video, I'd probably never have an opportunity to mention it, so here we go. The game is called Gatekeeper, specifically Gatekeeper Infinity, which is the prologue version, which is what game developers are calling demos now. Don't even get me started on the ridiculousness of calling a demo a prologue. I don't even, I don't understand Stan, what's the point? Why are we changing common vernacular? Sorry, I blacked out for a second there. Anyway, Gatekeeper is like Risk of Rain, but top down. Less fun and less polished at the moment, but the game hasn't released yet, so let's just be patient. Let's give them time, okay? They have a really cool idea here. The game feels good to play. A lot of the enemies are relatively intuitive with the way they attack. Although I, I would like for them to change some, like just delete this turret enemy. It's not fun to hunt them down. It's not fun to fight them. Give them frickin' wheels or something. I don't know, just they suck. Whatever, I'm getting sidetracked. There's different characters, and the characters have their own movesets, just like in Risk of Rain, and you're fighting hordes of enemies as you're powering up, collecting items, leveling up those items, leveling up your character's abilities. A lot of the same stuff that uh, Risk of Rain has is here. But for some reason, in my mind, it still kind of feels like it's at least adjacent to vampire survivors and the bullet heavens that we've come to know and love. And that's probably because it's got this top down view as opposed to the side scrolling view that we're used to in Risk of Rain. It's so much easier to dodge bullets in a top down fashion than it is uh, when you have to deal with gravity in a more platforming way. Of all the games that I mentioned in this video, this one is free. It's got a demo, you can go play it now. I would highly recommend giving it a try. It's pretty cool. Keep an eye on this one. I think this one has a lot of potential. Uh, I just hope that they iron out a lot of the things that I really didn't like, but I think in a video like this, it's not worth going over in exquisite detail all the things that I didn't like about every little game. Not just because these games are being constantly updated, but because it would make this video probably last way too long and be way too boring. So, so you know, take that as you will. Anyway, that's all the games that I wanted to talk about in this video. I think it's less than I talked about in the previous video. But you know what, that's okay. Not every video needs to talk about nine games. Honestly though, despite all the praise that I've given in this video, I'm kind of sick of seeing games in this genre. Like I said at the beginning, it's kind of hard to walk five feet without bumping into another one. This genre has become so oversaturated so quickly that it puts the battle royale craze to shame. And it's probably because these games are relatively easy to make. They're small, they're arcade-like, and they have a proven track record. Unfortunately though, even though this kind of game is pretty good for practicing game development, it's probably not worth putting these on the store anymore. At this point, you have to be exceptional to stand out. And while that's true in game development in general, it's extremely true in something as oversaturated as this is. It's an unfortunate situation to be in, especially if this is your new favorite genre. But oh well. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this minor departure from my normal content. I don't think I'm going to be doing another Bullet Heaven Vampire Survivors-like video again. I think two is enough. But I do really enjoy going over groups of games that are quote unquote clones of something that was really popular. I've done it with Factorio, I've done it with Slay the Spire, and now I've done it with Vampire Survivors twice. Hopefully there's another breakout hit in the future that spawns a whole slew of quote unquote copycats. And we can get this show back on the road. Anyway, have you played the games in this video? Which one's your favorite? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thank you to my channel patrons for throwing their money at me and making me feel just a little bit better about myself. You guys are the best. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.